Good evening, everybody. Dennis McLean here from uh, the Geneva Literary Aid Society. Welcome to the uh, ninth episode of The Glass Hour. We still don't know when we're going to be able to go back to having live events here in Geneva, but one good thing about these online events is that we're picking up the audience around the world and we're reconnecting with people who used to attend our events here in Geneva. And I'd like to thank you again for those of you who continue to support our chosen charity, the Edith Wilkins Foundation for Street Children in Darjeeling. Uh, they're keeping well. So far, none of the children there have contracted the virus and uh, all is well so far. And tonight, it's our great pleasure to have Mark Malik brown as our guest. Mark Malik brown has written a fascinating memoir on his life and times as a globe-trotting problem solver for the UN, the World Bank, and the UK government. He has also lent his public relations expertise to progressive politicians in Latin America and Asia. Under Gordon Brown as Prime Minister, he was Minister of State in a British Labour Party government with responsibility for Africa, Asia, and the United Nations in 2007 to 2009. Prior to that, he was briefly UN Deputy Secretary General under Kofi Annan in 2006, when he famously complained that the US administration was allowing too much unchecked UN bashing and stereotyping. This annoyed John Bolton, the US ambassador to the UN, but uh, Mark refused to apologize. He was also head of the UN's largest agency, the UN Development Programme from 1999 to 2005, at a time when the Millennium Development Goals were adopted, along with the concept of the responsibility to protect. It was a time when the seemingly endless 9-11 war started with the invasion of, Iraq, of Afghanistan and then Iraq. He also oversaw the publication of UNDP's first Arab Human Development Report, which caused quite a sensation at the time with its focus on lack of democracy, the failure to emancipate women, and the absence of any secular education system in the region. He moved to the UN from the World Bank, where he served as Vice President for External Affairs, and he worked to change perceptions of the World Bank as being out of touch with the needs of the poor. He had previously worked at the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. He is also a former journalist for The Economist, a development specialist, and a communications consultant. When he was just 18 years old, he spent six months traveling from the Cape to Cairo. And in his memoir, which I'll hold up to you now, The Unfinished Global Revolution, he wrote of a world in which the crisis of governability is growing. You're very welcome, Mark, to the glass hour. Great, thank, thank you very much, Dennis. Um, looking forward to this. Good. I hope my introduction did justice to all your achievements, or at least to some of them. Just picking up on that last quote, um, you know, your your prediction or your, your your estimation when you were writing your memoir that the world we live in a world in which the crisis of governability is growing. It seems that uh, that is still the case today. Well, yes. I mean, I, I fear it is. Uh, I, you know, I, I very much, when I was writing that book, saw, which is now 10 years ago, um, saw a period where uh, the extraordinary sort of golden age, really, of, of, of Kofi Annan's secretary generalship, where really for the only time in the UN's life, uh, there was a kind of window of opportunity which a very able, charismatic Secretary General was able to fill to sort of rise, raise the ambition of, of, of the whole UN system. You know, I saw it closing in because it seemed to me that globalization had sort of replaced class as the great dividing line of modern society, not just northern countries, but southern as well uh, where those who are benefiting from from uh, globalization through greater integrated trade and the cheaper consumer goods it provided or the higher return on their capital that it delivered you know were pitted against those 
who were losing their jobs and losing their economic security because of globalization. And you know, it just seemed to me that the way national politics was shaping up as this contest uh, was also in its wake undermining what global institutions there were. They simply couldn't adjust to this new, if you like, political challenge. And so, um, you know, I, I anticipated that we might see a period of not just confrontation at the country level around the world, at the national level, but, you know, a, a vacuum of governance globally. And I, I fear that that's sort of happened now you know as the title of the book implied and the book itself overall implies i sort of remain an inveterate optimist i think to work for the un you probably have to be one um where you know i i still think it'll come right uh and that crises like the one we're living through at the moment may have a little bit of a silver lining behind the horror of lost life and disrupted economies and people being pushed back into poverty that maybe out of it will come you know a renewed commitment to sort of building a fairer and juster world but but we'll i suppose we'll see but, but where do you see that coming from when you have the united states for example withdrawing from the world health organization uh donald trump pursuing a very nationalist course in his uh in his management of the u.s administration and many other countries responding in, in similar terms, you know, becoming more inward looking and less, uh, less engaged in, in, in globalization processes. Well, I, look, it's a very good question. And I think, you know, if you go back to the aftermath of the 2008-9 financial crisis, uh, you know, you have seen 10 years where anti-establishment groups have, you know, surprised themselves and, the sort of more established political elites by pushing their way to power around this message of disenfranchisement of uh, blue collar workers and other such groups across the world. So by the time this crisis hit, you know, if you like these new more authoritarian center right populist leaders, you know, were, were in power around the world. So yesterday's sort of rebels were today's establishment, whether it was Trump in America or Bolsonaro in Brazil or Modi in India, or even people whose power preceded that, Putin in, in Russia or, or, or Xi in China. Nevertheless, all of them in their different ways, a lot of political differences amongst them, obviously, but you know they all reflected this sort of, if you like, frustration with globalization and uh, the, the elites which were seen as having facilitated it. But now they're the incumbents. They're the ones who are going to pay the price for the mishandling of this crisis. And I think, you know, incumbency is going to be a very difficult and dangerous badge to wear into an election. And, you know, the first election of the sort of new age of COVID uh, is going to be the American election in November. And, you know, we can see President Trump's playbook very clearly, which is to, you know, ride the group, you know, ride the same themes that got him to power four years ago. But, you know, will that be enough? Or will we see the beginnings of a return to, you know, a, a more engaged internationalist leadership? And, you know, I think that that choice is going to be played out in country after country. And, you know, yes, these new incumbents will argue it's better to put America first or Brazil first and to deny the science and, you know, focus on a kind of rather primitivist, dis-nationalist message. But I think there are a lot of people, a growing number, who will want to challenge that. And if they win that fight at the national level, then it will create the headroom for a renewal of international collaboration. Not necessarily lots of headroom. I don't think we're going to flip from this sort of bilateralist age that we're in now into some sort of honeymoon internationalism again. But I think you will see the beginnings of re-engagement around addressing problems like global health, which simply don't respect borders.
do you see do you have any sense of deja vu when you look at the kind of leaders the leaders you've been citing now uh, and you think about the people the countries you worked in back in the 80s you know the philippines bolivia peru i mean there's a lot of similarities between some of the characters you describe in your memoir and some of the characters on the world stage today huh? even i've seen the type before uh, <laughs> uh there is a there is a little bit of a sense of uh, deja vu and you know whether it's the theatricality of many of these leaders uh, as as much as the set of beliefs uh, that they promote. Uh, but equally, you know, I suppose because I did spend a decade of my life, you know, as a political consultant working with, with people challenging those kinds of leaders around the world, and another decade of near, well, half decade of my life uh, working on refugee programs, dealing with the victims of political breakdowns in their countries. Um, you know, I also have a healthy respect for the electorates who put people like this in power. I really do accept the message that it's when, if you like, the sort of left of center groups that I suppose I naturally feel at home amongst, you know, failed people is when you get this sort of protest and shift to the center right. So I, you know, while I'm willing to you know, condemn the leaders, I'm not actually willing to condemn those who vote for them. And I think, you know, both at the national level and at the global level, we've got to have better answers to their concerns and disappointments. We've got to have better answers to their economic security or to their children's prospects. And, you know, those aren't obvious and easy answers in a world where structurally we're reducing the amount of work as we apply big data and AI to all sorts of manufacturing and services processes where, you know, still the cost advantage of manufacturing in the South versus the North remains. So, you know, we're going through profound changes where it's hard to guarantee people their old economic contract, if you like, of a one job from when you entered the labor force to when you left it and the prospect that that job would pay for a proper life for you and your family and your kids' opportunity to go to university, etc. A lot of the sort of social contract which underpinned post-World War II progress is, is sort of melting down. And, you know, our politics, neither nationally or globally, you know, is providing good answers to people who feel themselves marginalized and reduced by what's happening. So do you think then you were, you were rather over optimistic in your memoir when you said that um, the completion of the shift from overthrow of the old to a more stable democratic order is on average a 10 year project? I mean, when you look at the Philippines today, for example, and the, the report that was issued uh, today, on the human rights abuses that have been occurring there over in recent years? No, look, I mean, I think, you know, elsewhere in the book, I, you know, I was a student of history as, a, a, as an undergrad and graduate student. And I, I you know, I also, you know, I have a profound respect for the fact that things come back. And, you know, many of the inequalities in Philippine society, a well entrenched set of ruling families, um, you know, have, have thwarted the building of a broad based, uh, if you like, middle class democracy in the country. And I think that my client and friend, Cory Aquino, and then later her son, who was also president, you know, moved the ball forward very significantly. Um, but, you know, not significantly enough to prevent the rise of a Duterte and for now Marcos's son to be a plausible candidate. Um, I don't think if odds on favorite at this stage by any means, but a plausible candidate to win uh, the next presidential election there. So, you know, history is full of two steps forward and one step back. And, you, you know, I, I, I think 
one, one has to in the UN contain one's, as I said at the beginning, inveterate optimism because the lessons of history uh, are rather similar. And, you know, I spent lots of my working life in post-1989 Central Europe and, um, you know, saw Hungary up close and Poland and, and indeed Russia as well. So, you know, there are two ones very cognizant of the fact that it's two, te two steps forward and one step back. Um, the sort of surge of apparent democratic hope of 89 has, you know, not disappeared, but, you know, obviously it's been a very rocky path forward with lots of setbacks. Have you been surprised by the course of events in the Middle East since the uh, Arab Spring? <clears throat> well, there was one sort of paperback edition of my book which had an Arab Spring, spring postscript um, where, where I was definitely too optimistic. Um, I blame it all on, on, on UN friends from the region who you know, said, give us a break, believe this is going to work. Uh, and the historian in me was always a bit warier uh, than the human rights activist in me. And I, I, I hope they were right. Uh, and, you know, it's proved problematic. But, you know, just as, you know, bad stuff comes back, so does good stuff. And, you know, I, I, d I don't think the story's over in the Middle East. And, you know, I think we are seeing a steady progress towards a widening of the sort of franchise in the Middle East, the greater participation of people. And I think, you know, if, if pre-COVID, we were reaching a point where you had massive demonstrations in Iraq against failed corrupt sectarian government. You had the beginnings of renewed demonstrations in Iran, uh, massive protests in Lebanon, which have been kicking back up again lately, despite the, co the COVID risk of debt to demonstrations. You know, all around, uh, an agenda which was recognizable to the veterans of the 2011 Arab Spring. Uh, these issues of uh, secular rule, of opportunities for a huge youth bulb, of the inclusion of women uh, in society, which seem to have been kind of knocked down uh, in the pushback against the 2011 Arab Spring uh, early victories you know, are coming back. So you'd always had a Tunisia, which, you know, had been changed fundamentally by the Arab Spring. But I think what you, you were starting to see was even where the door had been slammed back uh, on the liberalization of the spring, that that wasn't permanent. And I think you'll see, you know, renewed Arab Spring type pressures in the region. Rising from the ashes. Yeah. So when the, when the UN uh, development report on, on, the, on the Arab region was published, uh, you, you were taking quite a risk, I think, at the time and allowing that to go out, but it proved to be hugely popular. How do you think that contributed to debate in the region and to events as they unfolded after the 9-11 uh, the war started? Well, it was... You know, I, th I think the the impact was was very considerable. There were a million copies downloaded. Um, you know, it was a bestseller on a standard scale the UN had probably never seen before. Uh, and you know, it certainly proved one thing, which was you know I'd come to UNDP from the World Bank, and the World Bank we were able to throw very large amounts of money at different development issues. UNDP was much poorer and we had to be kind of selective in our interventions and try and find levers and triggers which would make, you know, a big multiplier difference. And these reports were one such trigger. I mean, you know, cheap pocket money in the broad wider cost of, uh, of international development, but remarkably effective. And I think effective for several reasons. One, because we used only Arab authors. So this wasn't the international community talking down to the region. This was its own intellectuals and, and policy experts making their own sort of 
clear diagnosis of 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 the Ill, political and social ills and, and and limitations of the region and you know then brutally laying it down and the reaction of these you know old and tired regimes at the time you know was was you know merely fueled the interest in the books i mean you know, I got came under a lot of pressure from the Mubarak regime at the time uh, to not let these books be reports be published. Um, you know, within some years, the re that regime was gone. So, you know, I, I I think the role of these reports in terms of you know giving intellectual and later political confidence uh, to a new generation of political activists in the region and indeed social activists as well was was very real and 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 and, and very important and it was flattering that you know the un which even if on the development side was slightly contained was doing a lot of political and peacekeeping work around the region the number of people who felt that these reports you know again were a critical part of our role in the region because on the political side it was very easy to accuse us of being too close to the americans and the russians and not you know really reflecting the and and above all being you know contained uh by by the israel us relationship in terms of our peacemaking and and political role um and you know this was seen as a counterbalance to that and you know so i think in incredibly important in lots of different ways. Ooh, uh, just for our viewers, we are uh, accepting questions for Mark, and we have one here from Wolfgang Schutt, uh, who asks, for years, if not decades, there have been discussions about reforming, his words, rather, the rather useless Security Council. Do you, do you think this will ever happen? Well, the last really big push to reform it came, you know, under the la latter years of Kofi Annan's secretary generalship and my time as his chief of staff and then as his deputy. And, you know, we were really hopeful for a while. I mean, we always recognized it was up to governments to decide, but we you know, tried to sort of offer every encouragement and gave them ideas and proposals in the hope that we would find a way through and you know as I think many probably are on, on, on this call are aware of you know ultimately what did for it was you know a combination of particularly the big three US, Russia, China being wary about expanding the council and second uh, wherever there seemed to be a candidate for membership that would enjoy broad support whether it was, say, Brazil out of Latin America or Nigeria or South Africa out of, uh, out of Africa or India out, out of Asia. Um, promptly, it, it provoked uh, the regional rival to resist this. So in the case of India, Pakistan was immediately wary or, uh, you know, in, 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 the, in the case of Latin America, there were a series of countries that rose against the idea of why Brazil, it's not Spanish speaking, you know, is it really representative of the region? And, you know, in Africa, you know, a view that this shouldn't be assigned to a particular country, that it should be a rotating chair or chairs, because there was a suggestion of two, two African chairs. And, you know, and, and the British and French, obviously who, who for whom membership is you know particularly pr particular privilege and historical consequence of uh, 1945 and no they'd never get it again in a fully fledged reform of the council you know wary but cautiously supportive of making the council more support you know stronger uh, more more strongly representative in the feeling that that actually would prolong uh, their, their, might prolong their role if handled right. And for a while during that particular phase of the discussion, I was indeed a British minister, so know this from all different sides. Um, but, you know, I, I, I sort of give you a little bit of detail on that background because, you know, at one level, it is hard to see when countries will be ready to reform themselves, when there'll be that, you know, really 
break, moment of complete breakdown, which will say this council simply isn't representative enough. We've got to restructure it. I think one way which may help is I think if Kofi and I had had it to do again, we would have both agreed that we should have steered countries away towards more of the African proposal rather than the, the, the idea of rigid country selection forever uh, in terms of an enlarged council. Because, you know, we've seen history lifts countries up and drops them back down again and raises them again with a sort of dizzying frequency. And that therefore, you know, in at the beginning of the council's life, there was talk about, you know, Brazil almost got membership then. Uh, and it was Australia that, that stopped that because Australia wanted it too if Brazil was going to get it. Well, you know, if Brazil had been a member from 1945 uh, through till now, there would have been good years latterly, but there would have been periods where there would have been military rule and pretty awful governments and also a broken economy. So, you know, I, I think if we could relaunch the idea of a form around a long fixed term of say five or ten years but anticipate that that would be then subject to re-election and possibly do that for all seats and create a voting system which would assure you know America and China particularly that they would continue to hold their seats. I think we've got to build that flexibility into the model but it's not just about membership it's about procedures as much as it's about membership it's about listening allowing the rest of the membership of the general assembly a more fuller voice it's about bringing non-state actors more fully into the into the council not not as voting members but as witnesses to events as sources of suggestions for solving conflict because it's become a kind of arid broken um, rigid institution, which not only doesn't represent the realities of global power today, but its whole process and procedures simply don't represent the modern nature of conflict, which is inside states, not between states for the most part, involves a lot of non-state actors. Its roots are economic and social, not strictly political and military. And, you know, the council struggles uh, to, to capture all of this in terms of the dimensions of its debate and, and, and procedures. Is the G20 a, a possible alternative to it in many respects? Well, you know, the G20 hasn't had a great crisis in the last year or so, I'm afraid to say. And, you know, I was very involved as a UK minister in taking the G20 from just a forum of finance ministers to, um, you know, a head of government process, which represented 90 odd percent of the global economy and, you know, seemed to be a way to bridge this. And, you know, it was, first a meeting in the US under President Bush just before he left office and then a meeting in London under Gordon Brown, uh, that it went to this head of government model. And, you know, for a while, I think we all hoped it was going to be more representative, but it's, you know, it, I'm afraid has shown, you know, even more rapid sort of ossifying of the arteries um, in some ways than the UN. And, you know, it's lost its spontane spontaneity and ability to respond quickly and effectively to crises. And, you know, so I think we, we haven't got it right there either. We're still struggling for the right answers to this. Yeah, I, th I guess the last meeting of the G20 was particularly disappointing because of their failure to make any commitment to action on climate change. I mean, given the fact that they are collectively responsible for 80% of greenhouse gas emissions and uh, it'd be very hard to make progress on implementing the Paris Agreement if we don't see some uh, action from the G20 particularly. Yeah, no, I mean, disappointing on climate change, disappointing pointing on the response to, uh, to, to, to COVID. Uh, but still, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, this is a group whose representative potential is very, very considerable if they could be made to work together. And, you know, to be honest, their performance is also a little bit gone up and down. Uh, depending on 
who's chair at a particular time. So, you know, I, 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 I wouldn't want to throw it out, but, you know, uh, let's hope it's best years are still ahead of it, and not behind it. Oh, given the uh, extent of the issues you, you outlined there concerning the effectiveness of the Security Council, how did you manage to get acceptance for the responsibility to protect our principle? Well, the answer is just, uh, and uh, more by a toenail in the door or, or, or finger in the door than through getting a foot or a full limb through the door, because you know, when finally adopted by the General Assembly... Uh, Perhaps, Mark, for our viewers, you, you could maybe uh, expand a little bit on what was, behind, what was the thinking behind it. Well, the, the responsibility to protect had got, you know, the whole doctrine, you know, it, it has a longer history, but had sort of come to the fore again, you know, after the tragedies in uh, former Yugoslavia, uh, particularly of Sarajevo and Srebrenica, and also of what had happened in Rwanda, and a feeling that, you know, maybe even particularly, mostly in Rwanda above all, that we, we had to break this convention that, uh, the UN, that, that, that the UN's rights to intervene to prevent a crisis were constrained uh, by the sovereign nature and the Charter's requirement to protect uh, the sovereignty of individual states and not to override it. You know, all of this had provided particularly for allies of countries which wanted to embark on abuses against their own citizens, a whole sort of protective shield of state rights and non-interference uh, to protect them. And, you know, this would be regularly cited in the Security Council, uh, notably by, by, by Russia and China, but others as well, US and on certain occasions, UK, France too. So. You know, there was a real feeling that we, we needed a new doctrine that would prevent another Rwanda. And um, so the idea of intervention uh, and the concept always was that, you know, it would be around an intervention where a government was entirely failing its citizens and indeed was the source of the abuse against them uh, to try and prevent that. But first and most importantly by non-military means to try and get development assistance in there, to try and get mediation in there, to get a whole range of, of, of international tools at play to try and disengage a conflict before it became deadly. And only as a last resort to, to fall back on, you know, some kind of military intervention if, 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 if necessary. And you know, it was that last step which so spiked the thing in the eyes of, 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 of many governments. And, you know, particularly Iraq, uh, you know, where there was an intervention which, you know, indeed, you know, cited earlier UN Security Council support for it, even though there had not been Security Council support on the eve of the intervention and the mission went, the US, UK mission went in unauthorized. You know, this was felt to show what would happen if you, you kind of open the door you, to, 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 to a responsibility to protect uh, kind of uh, intrusion on, on, on sovereignty. But, you know, for all of us in the UN, you know, Iraq was the horrible exception. And, you know, what you needed to do was get this doctrine installed, uh, understand that, you know, at the front of the wedge, it was all about non-military interventions and that military only came, you know, if everything else failed and was highly unlikely in most cases because of the reluctance of countries to put their troops in harm's way by, you know, putting them into a front line against a reluctant government that didn't want them there and, you know, would, would, would threaten them if they were deployed. So, you know, the hope was that it was a last resort and, you know, that people would accept its use was very unlikely. But unfortunately, in the post-Iraq UN, this consensus of the first years of the Annan Secretary Generalship, when anything seemed possible, had been broken. And, you know, so countries were deeply suspicious and hostile. And the first time the doctrine was 
deployed in a Security Council resolution, which was actually after uh, Kofi and I both left um, the UN, was in the sort of intervention against Libya, and it was put there by British and American drafters. And, you know, was so obviously an attempt to extend a mission whose purpose was to stop the killing of innocent civilians uh, to contribute to a, a, a ground invasion or intervention, you know, after that first task had been achieved and to the overthrow of Gaddafi. Uh, that of course it confirmed its critics' views that this was just giving Westerners a thin end of the wedge to do military interventions when they wanted it. And, you know, that has really unfortunately, tragically set back the real sort of adoption and cultural integration of this doctrine into the work of the UN. And as you as you write so well in, in your in your memoir, democracy does not flow easily from the barrel of a foreigner's gun. Indeed. Do you, th yeah. you think that lesson has been learned now? No. I don't think it ever will be probably. I mean new generations of politicians will have to continuously um, relearn it. I mean, what I think is always striking to me is, you know, how most politicians, when they become prime minister or president, have for the most part, you know, got there through a route of domestic politics. And, uh, you know, maybe some have briefly been a, a foreign secretary or something in their governments or secretary of state before they arrive at that supreme job, but they are, you know, largely domestic political animals now taking on an international uh, responsibility. Mark, one of the areas where, you know, the thinness of their knowledge is most deployed, the most evident is around this issue of, 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 of conflict and peace building. And, you know, there are just a wealth of literature that those of us who've been in the UN, but in the US State Department or the UK Foreign Office or it's Swiss or Austrian or any other counterpart, you know, all pretty familiar with, you know, the very careful conditions that need to be in place for any kind of intervention to do net good. Um, and, uh, you know, of, of heart, you know, the RAND, uh, RAND has done endless studies of, of interventions in the post-World War II era up till the present. And, you know, it shows about half of them work, half don't. But the ones which do work are where there is an acceptance by the different sides to the conflict that it's probably time for an intervention. Uh, so there is some degree of acquies acquiescence, if not full welcome. Um, there is an exhaustion. The conflict's exhausted the sides. There's a basis for an agreement because, you know, one or both sides are willing to make concessions. You know, a whole lot of preconditions need to be in place for successful interventions, for the barrel of the gun, if you like, to uh, be the midwife to uh, a new democratic start for a country. And most national politicians are utterly unaware of that rather complex history. And, you know, take a blood goes to the head approach to this, you know, their country has been, um, you know, its pride has been come for a fall because some tin pot dictator has uh, ignored its instructions to, to step down or, or, or step down uh, its road to combat. And so, you know, whether it is Saddam Hussein in Iraq or my UK case, Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe, you know, there is an emotionalism about how these figures or and Gaddafi is another one, are dealt with, you know, which is entirely at odds with, you know, what the cold, dispassionate history and diplomatic experience tells us should be the way to deal with these individuals. What about, would you make an exception for Syria? For Syria? Well, look, I mean, I think, you know, Syria, there was a very clear need for a limited intervention to protect civilians at different points in this conflict. And we, we nearly had it under the sort of Cameron Obama, um, you know, axis, um, Hollande axis. And, um, 
you know, it, it, it didn't work because, you know, people blinked at the wrong, wrong moment over the wrong issues. You know, what I don't think would have worked would have been a full-scale invasion to overthrow the Assad regime, but I think a much more robust military containment strategy to protect civilians, to force uh, Assad back onto his sort of Damascus and Alawite heartlands um, would have actually forced a successful negotiation between the different warring partners. You know, instead, you had Assad having seen the West blink and with his Russian support believing he could push this to a military solution and perhaps even to this day not understanding that a military solution is impossible. And a lot of rebel groups who took false comfort from the words of Western politicians rather than from their actions. And so, you know, this has been a conflict where both sides have overestimated their own strengths, both internal sides, and where the external actors have, you know, talked tough, but then, you know, actually their big stick has been shown to be a matchstick when it comes to, it, to, to, to sort of actual engagement. And many have died and millions continue to suffer. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, um, how do you think uh, Kofi Annan's uh, term as Secretary General was influenced by his experiences of what happened in Rwanda, the genocide there? Well, I think it was in the sense that um, you know, he, he allowed a very, you know, brutally frank uh, lessons learned exercise to occur on his own watch. And, you know, doctrines like responsibility to protect and a whole focus, I think, on, on, on Africa and conflict resolution there and the deployment of you know, unanticipatedly large numbers of additional missions uh, on, on the continent were all in part consequences of, 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 of that. And, you know, you know I think it, it's the case that, you know, this was a Secretary General who for better and in that case worse you know, was the sum of his experiences as a UN leader over many years. Um, it taught him a lot. It gave him a network around the UN. It gave him a trust that he was one of us. He'd come up through the ranks uh, and, you know, then was able to build on it this extraordinary sort of global leadership, which was so unlike most UN officials, just his ability to talk in a language and connect with leaders and people around the world uh, uh, in ways that hadn't been seen before. But it also gave him, you know, if you like, this Achilles heel. Uh, he'd been there for Rwanda. And, you know, I think it was a very difficult issue for him. You know, what well, difficult. It's an issue that never went away through his Secretary Generalship. And I was, you know, at a birthday party given for him just in the end, it emerged shortly before he died, and it was a sort of public birthday party. So he was interviewed by the BBC um, for for a broadcast. It was his last big television interview, and you know a lot of it dwelt on just the question you've asked. So, you know, he he never escaped it, though we, his friends, felt he dealt with it maturely and honestly, and as effectively as any human being could. Thanks, Mark. I'm just going to move now to some questions from viewers. And staying with Kofi Annan, we have a question just come in about the uh, Oil for Food program in Iraq. This is from Anthony. Um, he claims that it was the largest UN managed program and the most corrupt. The audit showed that at least $320, $310 million of the $1.6 billion budget was not accounted for. Do you regret publicly defending it? Well, I don't think, remember, I don't think you did defend it. Did no, you? I, no, and this is, you know, uh, look, this, this is, um, you know, I was in the development side uh, during the latter years of oil for food and then came across to the political side of the UN as chief of staff and deputy during the period that the program was under huge investigation. So what I defended was our investigations of the program, uh, not the program itself. What I sought to do about the program itself was 
to put it in context, that the corruption in the program lay in a system of kickbacks agreed between Iraq officials and those they gave contracts to. And you know, tragically, some individual UN officials got drawn into that network of corruption. But you know, the suggestion that somehow $300 million or any other number you know, went to the UN or to individual UN officials, no. This was a program which by its very nature was incredibly difficult to, to monitor and control because you know, there was limited access, there was periods of time when UN monitors couldn't go see how the contracts were being deployed and used in terms of uh, uh, approved item of import. But the nature of the program, which was Iraq was allowed to access monies held internationally in escrow accounts from its sale of oil to buy approved goods for the well-being of its citizens. And the job of the UN was to make sure that that, that, that was what it bought and not other things, you know, was a difficult program to do when you had a country that was doing its best to defy all the Security Council resolutions, including the ones governing this program. So an absolute nightmare of a program to manage. But yes, one which led to really regrettable corruption and failures, for which the UN paid heavily. We have another question here, Mark, from Louise. Uh... How do you see the future of international humanitarian work in the context of increased nationalism and health and environmental crises? Funding from donors to the UN, which filters down to NGOs, seems to be drying up as governments focus on their own countries. And in this crisis, we have seen most international staff have been locked down and are working from home. Look, very good interlocked set of points there, mm. Louise. I, mean, I, I think first, you know, I'm on the board of quite a few NGOs and, you know, I've been warning them and that we've got to kind of have scenarios for, for cuts because, you know, even ones which are deeply involved in public health are going to suffer from tighter budgets because, you know, for example, the European donors are clearly going to start reducing their budgets as their GDP shrinks because their aid budget is in many cases linked to a portion of GDP, 0.7 or some other uh, number. So there's a real risk that funds are going to contract. And, you know, even within the funds available, priorities are going to shift. Huge amounts of money very understandably being raised for vaccines. But, you know, that's money which won't go to ongoing public health programs or to, you know, other critical development uh, objectives. And so, you know, it, it's going to be a very difficult time. And Louise is right, at the same time, an awful lot of, you know, international and national, you know, development workers are in lockdown. So it, it, it's a fundamental uh, delivery and capacity crisis that uh, the system is 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 facing. Um, but I think you know, if, if if I could look forward, I would say that um, again, as the question a little implies, my own suspicion is that while this nationalism and my country first politics, which has so undermined. Uh, truly global response to this current COVID crisis. Um, you know, it, 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 as we move past that, and as I said much earlier in the session, as, you know, nationalist incumbents face the uh, judgment of the ballot box, I think, you know, we're going to see a kind of, if you like, more internationally minded set of governments either reinforced in their mandates or coming to power, and that you know, they're not going to kind of reboot the whole international system and write a huge check to, you know, go back to the UN as it once was. I think the international system is going to be profoundly remade over the coming years. But I think the places that remake is going to start around issues which are critically important to the well-being of people in North and South alike, and which simply don't respect borders. And those issues are public health, 
their food security, their climate change. And I think, and, and arguably their inequality because the consequences of inequality are instability, migration, etc. So I think, you know, you're gonna have three, four, five, six issues, which you will see cut through activity, both in terms of funding and not just by governments, but by the private sector and other non-traditional donor sources. Uh, cut through partnerships, which involve not just the traditional government actors, but new actors. And some of them will rely on existing UN and other international architecture. Some will reinvent or blow up existing architecture and rebuild it. So, you know, but I think you will see around those pillars, some real dynamism of rebuilding multilateralism. Mm. I liked what you said on, on another webinar where you said that just as austerity was the, um, the buzzword around the 2008 financial crisis to recovery from it, that this time around, let's hope it's resilience. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, it's more than let's hope. I think it probably will be. I, 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 you know, I can feel it in my political bones that it is the coming word. Um, you know, and what did austerity mean? Austerity meant certainly in the British context where it was most used as a stick to beat us all uh, by the government of the day. It seemed to be all about, you know, you stand, it's about individualism. It's about, uh, you know, stripping out government support. Uh, it was about a sort of value system where, you know, it wasn't so much, it wasn't the exact intention of its architects, but where it was certainly the consequence that the price of austerity, the price of economic adjustment seemed to disproportionately fall on the poor and on working people as against the owners of capital, the wealthy, the industrialists, big business, etc. I think resilience implies solidarity, it implies partnerships, uh, it improves burden, it implies burden sharing. And so I think it brings to the fore a set of values which are very different and which I think are going to be at the core of successful recovery. I don't see the current American president embracing them. Um, but, you know, I think you are going to see a shift to a politics that does put this idea at the center. But again, you know, as I've said several times here, I don't see a massive swing of the pendulum. It's not gonna go that we're going from austerity and my country first to global solidarity and, uh, you know, mutual respect and burden sharing in one single swoop of the pendulum. You know, my, I suppose this whole book and my whole life has been about it's never that simple. Question here from Linda Stoddart. Uh, how do you view the current process of reform of the UN? Do you think it will lead to improved effectiveness? Well, look, I think it's all important stuff and you know, bravo to, um, to, to what's being done. Um, but, you know, I, I, and you know, in my book, I begin one chapter by saying every secretary general has his own UN reform yes. program. And, um, you know, and, and I think every Secretary General, and probably ourselves included, when I was there, you know, a, 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 a little, can often be a little guilty of betting, getting caught by the inside on this, by the inside story, where, you know, changing your resident coordinator system, for example, you know, seems huge because it is, in fact, a huge, you know, sort of exercise in persuasion and moving the different vested interests and stakeholders in a direction you, you want them to go. But to the rest of the world, it seems pretty immaterial. There's still a UN individual in country leading the country team called the UN resident coordinator. The changes that you think matter are actually under the bonnet changes. They're the changes that happen behind your computer. It's still the same screen looking out at you and the world. And I think this is why I talked about these four or five pillars where I think change will happen, because those are pillars which affect real people's real lives. They're about their economic security. They're about their health. Uh, they're uh, about the quality of their environment. And so, you know, I think what the UN has to attach its reform to 
is, is, is it's got to start at the other end. It's got to start about how do we make people have better lives? And then what is the organizational structure to deliver that? And I think if you ask the question in that sequence, you'd come up with very different solutions. You'd put partnerships with not just the private sector, but civil society and other groups much more at the center of things. And now you put, you know, whole new approaches to raising resources. You, you do it in a very different way to, you know, what is ultimately a little bit of an internal conversation about sort of moving the pieces around on the UN's own checkerboard. Mark, we're, we're coming close to the end. So we're gonna, a couple of two quick, quick fire questions for you. One is, what single thing has given you the most satisfaction in your career as an international development specialist? Well, I mean, look, two, two, two things. One, as a job running UNDP, uh, this was a fabulous organization, one often less known out, well, outside, outside than some of the Geneva organizations like UN High Commissioner for Refugees, where I also spent many happy years and that whole UN community of friends and of people who I felt just such a bond with who'd similarly kind of left their home countries to do this stuff and you know were a community in which we all cared deeply about each other and about the shared mission you know that was for me the most exciting uh, period of my life and I think you know the results we were able to achieve such as the adoption of the Millennium Development Goals or those Arab Human Development Reports or some much more personal moments of seeing refugees whose lives have been saved as a young refugee officer. For me, the UN gave me a, a, a platform, you know, on which I was both personally able to find great fulfillment, but, you know, above all, to answer that great question of life, can one feel one's made a difference and you know now today i share the un co-chair the un foundation i'm on advisory boards to the heads of both the imf and 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 unicef and the ngos that i'm involved with crisis group that i chair some others you know all around this same space it's you, you know for me i've moved beyond the sort of intergovernmental un leadership bit to much more of the civil society end of it but that to me is just carrying on the same conversation and journey, which, you know, has been for me a life's journey. Question from Susan. What's it like to have dinner with George Soros? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, you know, um, it used to be much better than it's become. Um, he, he now, the, there used to be some very fine wine at the table. Now it's rarely there. Um, really? More, uh, well, you know, he, 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 he's, the reason he's 89 and still, you know, jumping into the world's issues with the energy he is, whether it's SDRs for the developing country, uh, fiscal headroom in this crisis or perpetual bonds from Europe, you know, it, it's all done on a mixture of homeopathic remedies, uh, careful diet and, and low alcohol for consumption. So at one level, the dinners have become less fun. At another level, they are, you know, they, they, he has become one of my closest friends and a friend now of 25 years and, you know, in and out of the UN around human rights and many other issues. Not only, are, I like to think that we're pretty inseparable on a lot of this, which our critics certainly think, um, but another example of somebody who's been pretty single-minded in a life from, you know, all the way from a young Jew in Budapest through fascism, through communism, to making a fortune and wanting to give back. And his is a life journey that I have as much admiration for almost as I do for Kofi's and the other great heroes and elder brothers, if you like, of, of, of my career. If you were 18 years old again today, Mark, would you still uh, set out on your trip from uh, the Cape to Cairo? I think I would actually, in some ways, you know, in, in, in those days, the threats were, you know, 
for a young, slightly wide-eyed Englishman. I remember there was one area of northern Kenya we were to drive through or take buses through. And, you know, this is now a generation ago where, you know, some hard-bitten guy at a um, white hunter at a bar in Nairobi was able to persuade us that, oh, there's a tribe up in their mills. Uh, they cut your balls off. And um, uh, there hasn't been a white man who's got through their mills with his balls in years. And we were both, you know, naive <laughs> enough to kind of believe this. Today, the threats are more real and transparent. But I'll tell you, that journey, because, you know, I've spent huge amounts of time in Africa since, but that journey, you literally spend months, weeks traveling, you know, and to see countries like Zambia or, or Tanzania up close on the ground, mile by mile, gave me a kind of ground map of Africa in 1972, against which I've continuously compared Africa since. And when I think about the sort of light industry and services that were there in those days, when those economies were highly protected in the earlier post-colonial years, uh, versus the Africa of 25 years later, when economic adjustment had swept away all that, and you'd seen a, you know, just cheap imports from the West and then later from China, displace local industry and services, to now where you begin to see the makings of a long-term African economic model uh, and the potential to future self-sufficiency. I hadn't had my 1972 benchmark of traveling from the Cape to Cairo, um, although I did actually have to hop over those tracks with the machete. Um, the, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure my understanding of what has changed and what then went back before moving forward again would be nearly as complete. So no, I, I, I don't miss that. I, I would do it again at a heart speed. Great. Mark, it's been a real pleasure. Uh, I've really enjoyed reading this book. I highly recommend it to all our viewers. Uh, it's a fantastic read and it's really, you know, history in the making. It's the first draft of history, I would say, as all the best journalism is. And uh, as Christina writes here on our chat, very interesting and informative interview, gracious and elegant speaker. Mark, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Well, thank you. And thanks for definitely giving up your time. And stay safe during the uh, rest of the COVID uh, period. Yeah. Stay healthy. Thank you very much. Right. Good night, everybody. Talk to you again soon.